All right. Well, uh, thank you again for joining us this morning. I think we're uh, ready to get started here. Uh, so my name is Bill Lowe. Uh, with me here, I have my colleague, Josh Steele. Uh, we are two of the founders of Paragon Compliance. Uh, just a little housekeeping matter before we get into the, the content of our presentation today. Um, to the extent you have any questions about the materials, anything that we come up that you want to talk about a little further, just please feel free to uh, submit a question. We'll do our best to keep up with them and provide responses uh, to, to all of them that come in. All right, so just take a, a brief look at the uh, agenda for what we're planning to discuss this morning. Uh, first, we're just going to begin with a brief overview of Paragon Compliance. Uh, give a little background on who we are, uh, what the services are that we provide. Um, next, uh, we'll review some common 1095C errors. Um, you know, we, we deal with a host of different clients from different sectors, uh, public and private, with their own unique uh, compliance challenges. And uh, we hope to go through some of the, kind of the more common errors we see explain uh, what causes them and how best to address those, both to correct them and to avoid them from uh, appearing in the first place. Then we'll also spend a little time discussing letter 226J. Uh, we're planning to have a more in-depth webinar in a few weeks on the 226J, uh, but today we want to provide an overview, just you know what exactly these letters are, uh, what you should do if you happen to receive one, and I think most importantly, what you can do to avoid receiving one in the first place. And then again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we'll, we'll finish by answering any questions uh, those of you in, ten, in attendance may have. Okay, so briefly, who are we at Paragon Compliance? So we've been providing ACA compliance services since 2010. Uh, Josh and I, together with our third co-founder, are practicing attorneys with backgrounds in labor and employment and employee benefits law. Um, and then our team is comprised of kind of two groups of individuals. We have compliance professionals with both legal and HR backgrounds who, since the Affordable Care Act uh, was enacted, have dedicated themselves to, to understanding the intricacies of the law. Uh, this allows us to help our clients comply with all of the ACA's many requirements. Uh, we also utilize a team of skilled IT professionals, which means that we're able to ensure the client data we're analyzing accurately represents what our client systems intend for that data to show and that the data is going to be securely stored at all times. In addition to ACA consulting services, at Paragon we also offer Form I-9 compliance and audit services, as well as sexual harassment prevention training and policy development. Um, so again, the focus here will be on uh, ACA issues, but to the extent you have questions about any of our other offerings, uh, please feel free to reach out to us for more information on those. So focusing on what we do around ACA compliance, uh, when the law was first passed, we spent uh, a great amount of time educating our legal clients regarding the law and its specific requirements uh, that it placed on employers. Um, at this time, uh, you know, we were frequently asked to help coordinate you know, the compliance-related activities for our clients. But as attorneys, you know, we really didn't feel we were best suited to do this. Uh, but as time went on, we, we realized that there were very few entities out there who were offering comprehensive solutions for ACA compliance. Uh, there was no one out there with a, a real focus on compliance uh, that could meet the needs of, of the clients as we saw them. Uh, so recognizing that there was this kind of void in the marketplace around ACA, we set out to build a compliance solution that was focused solely on ACA, that would again address these specific needs and issues that our clients had kind of been repeatedly uh, informing us about. And ultimately what we developed uh, was a, a comprehensive consulting service that leverages our proprietary software technology that was built specifically for ACA compliance. Um, and then through the diverse skills of our team, we're able to utilize this technology to effectively function as really an outsourced ACA compliance solution for our clients. Um, we handle both monthly employee tracking and analysis, as well as the production of all 1094C and 1095C forms uh, in submission to the IRS. Uh, just a few ways that, that our team is different from your traditional ACA vendors. Um, first, you know, the one I just described is our team. Uh, we combine focus on exceptional customer service with real in-depth analysis um, that's provided by true experts on the ACA. Um, this has been our focus, again, since the law uh, was first enacted. And then also our dedicated IT team allows us to focus a great amount of energy on data validation. Uh, with ACA compliance, it's truly 
um, you know, garbage in will result in garbage out with respect to the forms and submissions to the IRS. Um, we know that if the data we're receiving and analyzing from our clients isn't properly scrubbed at the front end of our process, we're going to run into issues on the accuracy of our forms. Uh, and so because of this, our team places a real emphasis on data validation. Next, you have our technology, which I already described um, you know, a minute ago. And then finally, confidence. Uh, because of our skilled team and our comprehensive process, uh, as well as the influences that we bring to this from our legal background, um, our clients have grown to have complete confidence in their compliance status. Uh, we've been able to bring, I would say, a certain amount of certainty to ACA compliance for those that we work with. And so why does all of this matter? Uh, why is it important to, to kind of bring this approach to ACA compliance? Uh, well, because the ACA is complicated and it's important to have a team supporting you who brings some expertise to the area. Um, many of you in attendance work for public employers in New York. So several of the items on this slide will likely hit home for you, but uh, you know, I think the first two really tie together. Um, anyone who has a unionized workforce that also has to comply with multiple collective bargaining agreements um, is, is absolutely going to have a complex benefit structure. Uh, this is particularly true with respect to employee contribution rates, um, as these may vary from bargaining unit to bargaining unit, um, as well as within different uh, individual units. And, and this complicates things in many ways, especially with respect to calculating affordability. Um, we also know that many public employers are self-insured. Uh, Josh is gonna talk about this specifically in a minute, but, but this rate has the potential to significantly complicate uh, compliance for employers. And then finally, it's important to have an ACA partner who has expertise. Uh, because the IRS enforcement regulations and guidance seem to really change every year. Uh, in some ways, the IRS is really still figuring out how to enforce the ACA and its regulations, um, and our team's deep understanding of the law will allow us to quickly respond to changes and ensure our clients remain on the path to compliance at all times. So, again, just a brief overview on, on who we are here at Paragon and what we do, uh, and with that, I'm going to turn things over to Josh. Good morning, everyone. So I'm going to talk about just some real common 1095C errors that we've seen. Uh, a lot of these are very prevalent in the public sector, uh, especially with school districts, and then briefly how we address them and how, how you should address them uh, internally. Uh, the first one is simple enough, it's termination dates. Um, believe it or not, it's a, it's a very simple piece of information, um, but often it does not make it into internal systems and it causes a lot of errors with respect to both the Form 1095Cs and your month-to-month -month compliance training. Um, this happens when sometimes people, uh, let's say they, they stop or they retire as uh, one position, but they're not actually officially terminated. They're still left on the books. You know, the, the appointment might have ceased, but, you know, we don't want to go through the process of putting in a termination date because then we have to go through the process of rehiring. The problem with this is that then you have a situation where you can have a 1095C form entered where somebody is still listed as, for example, the full-time employee, but is no longer receiving an offer of coverage. Uh, that's a very problematic issue. It can cause errors with 1095C. If you've got a pretty large turnover in your workforce, this can drop you below the 95% threshold uh, where you're required to offer coverage to at least 95% of your full-time employees and subject you to significant penalties. Even if it doesn't do that, if we're filing forms with the IRS that are incorrect, there's a separate penalty for doing that, and that can be up to $600 per error on each form. So that adds up rather quickly. Um, so that's one thing you have to make sure that you are entering termination dates when somebody is no longer working and communicate those so that they can be taken into account when doing your uh, Form 1095-C. Kind of in the same vein as that, and this is something that we see uh, a lot with public schools and school districts, is retirees returning to work. So the common scenario here is that you have a full-time teacher, they've been a teacher for 30 years, they retire. Obviously from a district standpoint, if that individual is interested in returning and being a substitute teacher uh, the following fall, that's great. That's somebody that knows the district, we know we've got a good relationship with them, and we think they're going to provide good services to our students, right? The issue with that is when you come back in, oh, we'll classify them as a per diem or a part-time as, as any other substitute teacher. but under the ACA, if you're using a look back measurement period with a standard stability period, that person is going to remain full time in that fall. So when they come back in September and start teaching on a substitute basis, even if it's only once a month, as long as they're still on the books, they will come through as an ACA full time employee, but they will be ineligible for coverage. And again, that's something that can expose you to potential penalties under the employer mandate. Um, the 
one of the ways around that um, is something called the, the break and service rule, the employee break period rule. Um, when it comes to school districts, uh, in order for us to treat somebody as a new hire and ignore the fact that they might have been full time under a previous measurement period, they need to have a break in service of at least 26 weeks. Uh, so that's one way to get around that. And again, if we don't, it can have issues with our 1095C code combinations. Other issue fairly straightforward as well is incorrect hourly rates or health insurance contribution amounts. Um, the different payroll systems utilized by, in the public sector, uh, often they've kind of evolved over the years and we've gotten to a situation where we've got it working internally so that people are getting paid the correct amount of money in their paycheck, which is good. Unfortunately, sometimes in order to get to that situation, you actually have incorrect hourly rates um, in there. And that would mean that when we're doing affordability calculations for health insurance contributions for your 1095C, that can be incorrect. Uh, the other thing we often see is that the actual health insurance contribution amount that's reported on form 1095C is incorrect. Uh, the reason why that happens often is let's say in your internal system, you've got it broken down as uh, what someone's going to take out every paycheck. Um, as opposed to what the total monthly number is going to be. Um, and you have to report the monthly number on the Form 1095C. So that happens. So two issues again there. One, we could have affordability issues. Reporting is something is unaffordable, even when it is. Um, even when it isn't, excuse me. Or the second thing there, again, is that you could have incorrect information on your Form 1095C, and that can expose you to this other penalty of $600 per error. Uh, Social security number or TIN number, uh, taxpayer identification number, and name mismatch. So this is the most common error that we see when we submit 1095 Cs to the IRS. Uh, what happens here is that any kind of discrepancy between an employee's name and the social security number, or if you're self-insured, a dependent's name and their social security number is going to kick back as an error from the IRS. Um, why does this happen? Uh, it can be because somebody, uh, according to the Social Security Administration, uh, has a hyphenated last name, um, but in your system that isn't the case. Or it could be that somebody got married um, and changed their name with a district, but did not change the name in terms of the Social Security Administration. Uh, it can be spacing issues, um, whether there's a space between uh, you know, a, a D and the rest of the last name. All of these things pop up, they flag as errors, and we want to make sure that we correct them so that we're not going to be an issue for failing to correct an, an error on the 1085C. Uh, but this is extremely common. The other issue this happens a lot too is when we have dependents a lot of times, when we're, they're first added to health insurance, um, we don't have a social security number for them as an employer yet, so we put in a date of birth. That's fine to do as a placeholder, but eventually you'll want to get a social security number on there uh, so that you're compliant with the, te the, the, the IRS's rules regarding the 1095C. So, Another common issue is payroll system designations as either part-time, full-time, per diem. Um, we understand that those are used for internal purposes, uh, but we want to make sure that a internal payroll designation is part-time, per diem, or, or full-time does not trump the ACA's designa designation of ACA full-time or not. Um, when someone's designated as part-time, unless they're a new hire, uh, that designation does not have any impact on whether or not they're ACA full-time. We need to make sure that the ACA analysis of their hours worked is what's determining their ACA full-time status, not an internal designation of employee type. Um, there's a couple of common issues and scenarios where this occurs. One is where a full-time employee changes to part-time mid-stability period. So this is somebody that has worked enough hours over their previous measurement period and they are now in a stability period and so under, in terms of the ACA, they are going to remain ACA full-time for a 12-month period, regardless of how many hours they work. They could drop down to two hours a month. It doesn't matter. They're still ACA full-time as long as they're still employed. Uh, we need to make sure that this, those people are continued to treat it as uh, full-time employees, regardless of what the internal designation is. And that might also mean offering them coverage. The other issue we see this, and this is especially prevalent in school districts, is where you have a part-time employee that works multiple positions. Um, and each one of those positions is totally part-time. But when you add them all together, all of a sudden now you're working full-time hours. Uh, that's something that our system captures that internal systems often don't. And we're talking about situations where you might have a 25-hour teacher aid, but then you know they also uh, chaperone events or sporting events and get paid hours for doing that. 
uh, might also proctor examinations on the side, might actually help out with curriculum work or anything else. All those hours need to be accounted for under the ACA when determining full-time status. So self-insured coverage, this is probably the largest issue. So employers that offer self-insured coverage uh, have to fill out an additional part of the Form 1095C, uh, this Part 3. And in that Part 3, you have to list everyone that was enrolled on your self-insured coverage. So that's generally uh, an employee independence or employee spouse independence. And you have to indicate which months of the year they were actually enrolled in that self-insured coverage. Um, and this is something that the IRS requires uh, and that the 6056 and 6055 regulations regarding employer reporting require as well. So what we see a lot is inconsistencies between the information you receive from your uh, health insurance administrator um, indicating who was enrolled and for what dates and comparing that data to the data in your internal systems. Um, we see lag. So a lot of times somebody will be in our situation, we know we offered them coverage in, let's say, the month of May, and we know they enrolled in the month of May. But for some reason, the self-insured report, when it comes in, doesn't have them covered in the month of May. It has them picking up in June. Or it might be that they will eventually be listed as covered in May, but it won't be until three or four months later. And you have to make sure that you retroactively go back and change that. Um, very important to do that. Another issue here is we need to report on employees that receive COBRA coverage. We need to report on retirees. Even if they're no longer an employee for us, if they're enrolled in our self-insured plan, they still need to get a 1095C because um, we're standing in the shoes of a health insurance provider or issuer. Uh, and the other part that you see this a lot and what we do to kind of address this is when we look at a, a form 1095C for a self-insured employee, we want to make sure that the information that we've got on the offer of coverage and enrollment um, in part two of that form matches up and is consistent with the self-insured information in part three. That's a real red flag to the IRS when they're looking at audits because we're saying, oh, we offered this person coverage and they enrolled on part two. And then you look at the self-insured information and it says that they weren't enrolled in coverage that month. That's an issue. That's an audit flag. That's an audit risk. And we want to avoid that. So there's a couple of specific issues within Envision, which we know is a, a payroll system that is utilized by school districts. So the one thing we run into probably more than anything else is that once an employee is terminated, uh, they will not appear in the subsequent census file reports, which makes sense. If an employee is terminated, they won't be in that next report. The issue arises that sometimes they're removed from that census report before we ever have a termination date. Uh, someone gets terminated towards the end of a month, great, uh, but it might not make it into that month's system if it's late. And then once they're terminated, that they're no longer on the subsequent reports, and now we have no history of this person ever being terminated. Uh, this kind of goes back to the issue with termination dates. This is one of the common causes of that. Uh, if we don't have a termination date, um, they'll be treated as a continuing employee, but they won't be being treated as being offered coverage. Uh, and that can be an issue with respect to the employer mandate offer of coverage requirement. The second part of that, again, is that it can result in an incorrect form 1095C, which can result in a separate penalty for having an error that you submitted to the IRS and provided to the employee. Uh, the second issue we see is that substitute teachers receive a default status of full time. Um, I'm not sure why this occurs, but we need to make sure we address it and address it quickly because obviously substitute teachers are not provided or generally not offered health insurance. And if we don't correct this issue, then you're going to have a substitute teacher treated as full time and ineligible for coverage. And that's going to impact your uh, offer a coverage percentage again, as well as having the incorrect form 1095C. So why is all this important? Because we have to file all these forms with the IRS, you know, a form 1094C, one of those, and then the form 1095C for each one of your ACA full-time employees and for anyone that was enrolled in self-insured coverage that wasn't an ACA full-time employee. So you have to file with the IRS no later than April 1st, 2019, according to the regulations. Uh, when you file a return with this error system, you'll get one of five responses. Accepted, which is the best, accepted with errors, partially accepted, rejected, or not found by the error system. The, the most common ones are accepted with errors. So if your transmission is accepted with errors, it means, listen, we accepted this because there was no fatal errors, meaning we allowed this transmission, we're accepting it, um, nothing to cause the rejected return, but there's still some issues here. 
Uh, obviously, one of the things we already discussed about the most common issue there is the uh, mismatch between the Social Security number and the name, uh, according to the Social Security Administration. That's when we get an acceptance with errors, uh, that's almost always the issue is that we've got name mismatch. We've got names mismatched with SSNs. Um, when do we need to cr file corrections? Well, the IRS has been helpful, and rather than providing us an actual date, uh, they just say, listen, you have to file corrections as soon as possible. Uh, given the uh, relative short period of time that the ACA has been in effect, uh, we don't have any case law on what the what period of time is as soon as possible. Um, generally, what we recommend is as soon as you have those errors, you start taking steps to correct them. And again, the common issue here is you know, the TIN mismatch. Um, you want to go through the better process for trying to correct SSN or TIN and name mismatches, something that we do here. And again, the purpose of this is not necessarily to correct the 1095C, although that's a great byproduct, but it's to ensure that you prove to the IRS in the event that you're audited that you took steps required uh, to go ahead and try to correct those issues, even if you were unable to do so. Um, one key thing, error messages are not proposed penalty notices. That's something totally different. And that's what we're going to get to now. So the letter 226J. Uh, hopefully, um, you haven't received a letter 226J, um, but if you have, uh, you know, we're here to help. So the ACA has been in effect for quite a while, but they really just in the past 18 months started issuing 226Js, and they've really ramped up on that process. So to date, the IRS has issued thousands of penalty letters. Those are the letter 226Js. Uh, enforcing the employer mandate and basically assessing penalties against employers dating all the way back to 2015. Um, they're kind of doing it a rolling period. And the best of our knowledge now, uh, while there are still some 2015 226Js going out for the 2015 tax year, they've at least made it up to 2016. Uh, we've yet to see any 226Js roll off for the 2017 tax year, but it doesn't mean it's not happening. It's just we have not seen them. Um, so again, these penalties letters are are pretty severe penalties on the employer mandate, and the IRS is relying on the fact that the ACA says that the IRS shall enforce this employer mandate, uh, treating it as a requirement. So regardless of how the IRS might feel about the ACA, uh, they're taking the position that they're required to enforce this, and they are. Um, this is a significant source of revenue. Uh, a lot of the ACA uh, is rather expensive uh, in terms of the government, and now the individual mandate is gone moving forward uh, it's been zeroed out to, you know, the penalty has been listed to zero. Uh, the employer made it's becoming very important to fund a lot of the provisions of the ACA, and so the IRS is going after it. So what is a 226J? Uh, it's a long letter from the IRS, uh, incredibly easy to understand, just like every letter from the IRS, right? Um, it includes a couple things, every single one, a table itemizing the proposed penalty by month, because again, this is another thing that comes in play here. The ACA, we report on it once a year, but the penalties are calculated on a monthly basis. Um, it includes an employer response form, which is 14764, uh, that you fill out with information about the, the employer um, address, who to contact, things like that. It includes an employee premium tax credit list, or a PTC list, as they call it. That's a form 14765. And that lists out by month the employees that the IRS uh, indicates are subjected you to a penalty under the employer mandate along with their respective Form 1095C line 14 and line 16 code for that particular month. So it's going to tell you, here's what the penalty is, here's who triggered it, um, here's how we're calculating it. One important thing to remember here, there are several different provisions that prohibit any form of retaliation um, against an individual who subjects you to an employer mandate penalty. Um, so make sure you don't do that. So what do we do if we receive one? Um, you have 30 days, you have to respond. Uh, you have 30 days from the date of the letter to respond. Now this actually becomes a bit problematic. 30 days seems like a great amount of time, except that usually you receive this letter five or six days after the date, the letter, uh, the date on the letter. So already you're down. And it's also the IRS has to receive the response by 30 days. So you've got to send it out to be sure five or six days early as well. So it actually cuts you down to a pretty short period of time. Um, what's in there? Responses can they can include a, a revised employee PTC list, so you can basically go through and say, listen, the information uh, for line 14 and 16 for this person that indicates, you know, for example, they weren't offered coverage. That's incorrect. They actually were offered coverage. 
uh, you can make those corrections to try to avoid some of the penalty. Um, the common thing we do also in responses is we actually draft the narrative. If we think there's an error or an issue, we draft a correspondence setting forth, you know, listen, here's why this is wrong. Here's why we're not, the client isn't subject to a penalty um, to kind of explain that to the IRS. And we've actually had quite a bit of luck with that approach, uh, providing a, a detailed narrative from a data standpoint. IRS acknowledges an employer response uh, in this letter 227. Uh, and if they buy uh, or agree with the arguments with respect to why you're not subject to a penalty or why the penalty should be less, then that 227 will include a revised penalty notice. Uh, if you still disagree, if you haven't, can't come to an agreement with the IRS um, on either the initial or the revised penalty amount, uh, an employer can request a pre-assessment conference with the IRS Office of Appeals where you can discuss this and try to, again, bring, bring them around to your point of view with respect to this. And then finally, if that's not not effective, you're going to have a final assessment that's communicated with notice CP220J. So obviously we want to avoid receiving a letter 226J. Uh, if you can stay off the IRS's radar, that'd be a great thing in general. Uh, it's time and, and resources. You don't have to you know, commit to that endeavor. So how do we do that? We've got a timely, complete, and accurate Form 1094C and Form 1095C filings. Um, what we're seeing with respect to uh, people that, that get letters 226Js, it's because, you know, either they didn't file at all with respect to the first reporting requirements for 2015, or they filed information that was patently incorrect. Um, the ACA penalties can accrue on a monthly basis, as I talked about before, so we can't take an annual approach to this ACA compliance. We need to know each month whether we're being subjected to a penalty, even though we're reporting on a monthly, uh, on an annual reporting once a year, we're still listing information on a monthly basis, and that's how the penalty notices uh, are, are calculated on a monthly basis. So the final thing is really important is complete an audit process of prior submissions. So the rules under the ACA is that you can submit corrections to any previous year of ACA filings at any time prior to receiving a letter 226J for that particular year. So if you've got an issue or an error with your 2016 or 2017 filings and you haven't yet received a letter 226J, you can correct that now and avoid the entire process of a letter 226J. Once you receive a letter 226J, you're no longer allowed to go through the corrections process. You have to deal with any issues or correction in that 226J process, which is where, again, there's an employer mandate penalty on the table. So you, you can audit prior your return and make any corrections that you need to make prior to that date. That's a really smart thing to do at this time. And so again, we, we plan to have a, um, a a more comprehensive presentation on the 226J generally. We wanted to give just a little overview of it uh, as part of this presentation. Um, as I mentioned at the outset, we <clears throat> at Paragon offer a, a full-scale ACA compliance package. Um, and I'll just briefly go through what that, what that would entail. So we have a two-step compliance program. Uh, the first piece being an initial assessment or an onboarding. Um, it, it's two different levels of, of service, but essentially what this is, is this is our front end way of bringing you into our system. And, and part of the, doing that is conducting essentially a full scale uh, workforce and benefits audit with a focus towards ACA. And the reason we do this uh, is twofold. One, we make sure that we fully and comprehensively understand your benefit practices, policies, offerings, anything that could uh, impact ACA compliance. And the second component of this is we make sure that we fully understand the data that's essential for uh, conducting ACA compliance work. So we, our IT team that I spoke of earlier, will conduct a, uh, an in-depth analysis, again, of the, of the data coming from the client systems to make sure that we can uh, correctly map it into the format needed for ACA compliance. Then, uh, on an ongoing basis, we, we offer monthly services. Again, these come in two, two levels of service, but generally what we are doing is we're receiving monthly data. So we're not waiting until the end of the year to analyze data because we know that, as Josh just mentioned, penalties accrue on a monthly basis. So we, we take in data from our clients on a monthly basis. We then work with our clients to validate that data we're receiving. Once it's validated, we, we upload it into our system and generate a series of monthly compliance reports. Again, our, our focus is making sure our clients um, are in compliance throughout the year. There are no surprises, and we can educate them on uh, both things that they need to worry about for current compliance, 
There's also, as well as issues coming up down the road potentially, so that they, they can take steps if, if any are needed in advance of any ACA compliance issue. Additionally, um, as you know, Josh just mentioned, uh, we, we offer services around the letter 226J. Um, because again, before you receive a 226J, you are free to correct any prior submissions to avoid receiving one in the future. So we offer two types of audits. One would be the, the pre-226J, which is the, obviously the preferred one. And that's where maybe you're unsure about things that were done in prior years, or you don't have a full level of confidence in the submissions that went out to the IRS, or you just want to be sure of things. Uh, our team can come in and analyze prior submissions. To the extent we identify any compliance issues, we can guide you through the correction process and submit those with the IRS to ensure that you don't receive a 226J. And then again, if, if unfortunately you may have received a 226J, we can help with a similar audit process to then analyze the scope of any issue. Um, is the IRS correct in the, the alleged penalty that they've uncovered? Um, if so, uh, then we can also help, uh, you know, we'll conduct an audit to uh, really assess that, but then we can also help in the process of responding to letter 226J. Again, just a little overview of our offerings, uh, but again, to the extent you, you have questions about them or would like more information, uh, feel free to reach out to us directly.